Welcome to Advisor Talk with Frank LaRosa. Brought to you by Elite Consulting Partners, it's the only podcast offering unfiltered guidance and direct advice for all things concerning financial advisors, RIAs, and the practitioners in the wealth management business. Learn more and subscribe today at EliteConsultingPartners.com slash podcast. And now, here's your host, Frank LaRosa. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Advisor Talk with Frank LaRosa. I am your host, Frank LaRosa, and I'm joined here, as always, with the president of Elite Consulting Partners, the man, the myth, the one and only Dale Dempsey. What's up, Dale? Good, good day. <laughs> I'm running out of intros. I got to figure out some more intros. Uh, hey, everybody. Bo- welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for watching. If you're on YouTube, um, if you're listening, you should check us out on YouTube. You'll be able to see our, our old studio. We're moving into a new studio in a couple of weeks, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, if this is your first time listening to us, welcome to the show. Uh, we hope it's really informative uh, for you. It's uh, really just uh, two guys talking about the business and things that went on uh, during the week before and conversations that we've had with advisors all over the country, um, advisors, business owners, uh, you name it. Um, so today I want to talk really about um, some stuff that's been going on and we've been getting a lot of calls and I'll categorize this or I'll I'll, I'll I'll describe this as, uh, so you have your own BD, now what do you do, right? Like we, we've been talking to a lot of people about this topic and we've been getting a lot of phone calls and whether it's a broker dealer or an RIA, uh, we get these calls and they're like, hey, I started my own RIA, you know, and I, I have, you know, I have $200 million in assets. How can you help me go recruit guys that have a billion dollars in assets? Uh, like, or I'm just being dramatic here, but the idea is that, there are a lot of people starting their own own broker dealers and more so RIAs, but then they want to get into this whole thing and think that they're going to be the next, you know, LPL or the next, um, you know, you name the RIA or broker dealer, right? Um, and they want to recruit and they want to attract talent and they want to do all these great things that they had in their mind, which is why they went independent in the first place, which is awesome. And I applaud them for that. But then when we start getting into the weeds of, okay, well, tell us about what your value proposition is. Tell, I'm a million dollar producer. Why should I join you? And that's sort of where, where the <laughs> conversations fall off a cliff. Um, right. You know, it's, and I applaud them for doing it, but it's, you know, it's like, okay, so you, you started your own RIA. Now what? Well, did you start that RIA with, with a purpose? I'm sure you did, right? And it was probably... You know, for the client's benefit, for your benefit, but was it in the for the benefit of another advisor or team joining you? And that's what we're finding, right? So thousands of broker dealers out there. I think it's something like three thousand. There's about almost forty thousand RIAs at this point. How are you different? Why are you, why would someone join you? And you, you and what we're finding is kind of what I think everybody suspected is that. A lot of advisors have started their own firm without that what's in it for them viewpoint. Well, well they started them with a lot of times where it goes is um, what do I need that person for? Right. What do I need the the parent RIA or the or the broker dealer, the independent broker dealer for? I can I can do all this myself. So I'm going to go out and start my own RIA because now I'll, I'll get a hundred cents of every dollar. Right. That's the. That's unfortunately some of some of where it starts, and if you're an if you're an individual producer and maybe you have it's just you and your and your team, so maybe there's a couple of principals. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, but then all of a sudden you go from from that to hey, we should recruit some people to the firm, and we should call some recruiting firms and see because we're good at we're good at what we do. We we know how to run money better than everybody else. Uh, what, what, we should be so much bigger. And then the problem is, is that you you've now changed your reasoning and your purpose for doing what you were doing, right? You went from what's in it for me, and it's still basically what's in it for me, right? Because they're they're not saying, and this is what we've seen, is what is you running money better than everybody else have to do with an advisor joining your firm? Like, how is that providing any value to that other advisor? So there's no purpose there. There's no connection and purpose. And I think that's where I see people, we see people fa- failing or not failing, but just not growing the way they want. Because in all of the conversations that they have with a potential recruit coming to the, their office, it's all about, well, let me show you how I run money <clears throat> and let me show you why I'm smarter than you. 
and let me show you why you should you should give me all your you know your asset managers and let me run the money for you um and it's just really not the way to go uh, the there are firms on the flip side that start an ria or an or a, a, an independent broker deal or a smaller one with a purpose and a vision of why they're doing it in the first place the ancillary benefit is they'll make more money right so you know, you you have to basically start. I know you, Dell wrote down some notes, um, and one of the and the, one of the first ones Dell wrote down, which is really poignant, is neglecting uh, to make a business plan, right? Right. And I think I, I was talking to someone locally, uh, an RIA locally, and they sort of just started it, like it just sort of came about, right? Right. No real business plan. Bunch of buddies together, brought on some clients. They have a good amount. I mean, they have a billion dollars in assets, so they're doing something right. Right. But there's no like business plan. All right, where are you guys going to go with this thing? What's your vision? What's you know? How many advisors do you want to attract? And I'm, we're not sure. Like, well, that's that sounds more like okay. So you had a business plan, but the end goal, you reached that end goal, which was something for the client, something for you, your staff, your your advisor friends, and now you've you've come to this point where, okay, yeah, we want to expand it. Yeah. Now what? So we do, but we want to expand it. The good news is there's plenty of opportunity to do so because you've got a lot of advisors still looking at, at I consider these folks pioneers in some case, maybe by default, sure. timing, whatever. But now you have opportunity to do so. So how do you, how do you create an environment where you can check boxes and say yes to just about everything that an advisor would want? So you know, it's really like identifying who you are, what you're good at, what you want to do, what you don't want to do, and putting a plan in place to execute on the things that you think are going to be successful. Right. Easier said than done. I mean, we talk about this stuff all the time. But I think what a lot of firms don't do, because we have this conversation too frequently, is um, I'm, co- I'm sort of just, I'm good at the, the basic stuff. Isn't that good enough? And right. the, the answer is, generally it's good enough for small growth but if you really want to build an enterprise and you have that mentality to do something that's going to leave a, a, a real impactful legacy you have to get creative you have to and you have to understand your competition because there's what 40,000 firms out there yeah we take we compare we you know when we get calls we try to essentially compare that firm to any number of firms that we're already working with to try to see what the separators are. Uh, because ultimately, if your goal is to grow the firm through acquisition, so acquisition, recruiting, whatever it is, uh, the things that you're saying in terms of what you do well, what you don't do well, um, the technology that you're using, right? whether you have capital, what is that ca- how are you going to use that capital, what are the economics going to be, all of those things go into a business plan. Um, all with the with the end goal of sort of like where are you trying to go and who are you trying to attract, and I think that firms make a mis- principles of firms, not firms, principles of firms make a mistake where they just say, well, you know, I'm willing to I'm willing to figure it out for anybody. That can get actually really confusing. Know your marketplace, know who you're comfortable going after, know who you're not comfortable going after. Um, but you have, you have to, I mean, look, it goes right down into what's your story about? Who are you? What's your, why was your firm founded? That's that's like, the, probably the single most important thing right. you can come up with when you're talking to a, a potential recruit. They want to know why you did this, what you're doing today, and where you're going with it. And how the, does it benefit them? What's in it for me? Right. Right. That's, but, where, that's where I see what's in it for me is where I see most successful advisors that become business owners that try to recruit. So they were a really successful advisor because they were good at sales because that's really, at the end of the day, what it really is. Yes, wealth management and all that good stuff, but it's sales. They become these business owners and then, and then they fail at recruiting other advisors to their firm because they don't know how to pivot the conversation to... Um, serving the new advisor, 
right? For most right. of their careers, they had somebody serving them, the manager, whoever it was, right? Would get them everything they needed. And now all of a sudden, now they have to sell themselves and sell themselves to the advisor about and how you're, you're, they are going to benefit the new advisor coming on board. Um, and I just, I see a huge problem with that. Um, where I think advisors make a mistake is they talk about themselves entirely too much. They talk about, you know, where they came from and all the great things that they've done in, in, in their career. And as an advisor, and, as an advisor, right. Right. Never. And, and that's an important thing because you want to understand like who you're getting into business with. So every right. advisor wants to do that, but they never, they never bridge the gap. Like they never, bridge over to how does this benefit you as a new advisor joining my firm yeah the the on the flip side of that but but along the same thought the firms that do it the best in this business have the best stories right they really do whether they went back to the 1800s or it was new-ish and they're doing something to solve a specific client problem that they actually found was disrupting the entire business as a whole or, you know, it's it's really personal from from advisor to practitioner to business owner. They all have the best stories, and they know how to tell them, and they know how to interweave the details of that story to their audience, and that creates real connections. But you know, like while you're building this, we we see these specific examples come across all the time, and so actually, so I'll bring a few up. If I was starting a broker deal or an RIA right now, I know there's voids out there. Yeah. There's there's like international clientele, the the margins on that business and the comp the complexity, it's not very attractive. But if I'm starting a business, I know I can absolutely find people in that segment. Right. So if I said yes to that, I automatically separate myself out. Right. If you're doing lending as an advisor, and you want to get paid on it, it's a rarefied group. A lot of firms say they can do it. When it comes down to it, it's it's not that big of a category. Again, I'd think about that. I'd also think about if you're if you're starting a broker dealer and you wanted to bring in some business pretty easily, not doing an override on the on the RIA that you're the friendly broker dealer for. So look, there's, yeah, there's, there's some risks involved in all of those things. Well, sure. Um, the, the, I think your bigger point is you have to have um, a rationale and a, and, a, and a good story and go after a niche. If you think that you're just going to start an RIA or broker dealer and say, I want to take anyone and everyone, you'll be running around like chasing, chasing cats, right? Right. Um, it's, it can be very daunting. But the other, the other component of that is you have to be thinking ahead. Um, so when you're talking to an, an advisor recruit, you know, what is your process of courting them look like? You know, who do you have on your team? Right. So is it you and a few guys and you're just you're all sort of you're all sort of doing a bunch of different things. Right. Uh, because you don't want to go out and invest in staff. Um, and notice I said invest in staff. Right. Not, not pay for staff or expense staff. That's a mistake that I think business owners make in our space is they look at hiring somebody new as an expense. You really need to look at it as a, an investment in whether it's you or somebody else in your team to go grow and build that story. Because if you have the right team, you can tell a better story. Here's our story. Here's our team. Here's the team you get to work with. This is the team that supports you. You're making it all about the new advisor. Again, you have to change your mindset because when you were the advisor, and I'm talking to everybody that was an advisor, and they now opened up their own RIA or broker dealer, right? When you were an advisor, it was all about you. Now you're the business owner and you're trying to recruit an advisor. It's all about them. Yeah. What does, if I buy special paper, <laughs> just be pip, <laughs> randomly picking something out, right? How does that benefit them? So if we're hiring a CFO, if we're hiring an analyst, if we're hiring a trader, right? You can tell the story of, listen, we have a trader on staff. So you don't have to worry about, you know, going through and, and putting in all your trades. 
someone can do that for you. How does that benefit you? It gives you more time to spend with your clients on the bigger things that bring in more assets, not the administrative stuff. Right? I, I hear too many times the excuse like, well, what about my staff? Well, you know, everything is online. Everything is e-signature. So, you know, a lot of stuff we do ourselves. That doesn't work for advisors, right? Have a staff story. Well, we provide staff so that you don't have to spend time doing the administrative stuff. You can go out and, and uh, go out and find more assets, right? Get more referrals from your clients. If you're not, a, if you're not talking about these things to the advisor because they're thinking about them, you don't have a story. Yeah, you're basically putting them in a position to where they're going to end up running their own business anyway, which is exactly right. the opposite of what you want. Right. You might, right. you know, they might have things that they do and, and the majority of the tasks are on them, but you still want to provide a, an environment and a platform. And that all goes back to, okay, like, you know, how are we going to build this and at what rate and at what scale? You got you to gotta look at your business currently and find areas where you think you can add value to advisors and, and adjust your economics accordingly. Yeah, you know, we talked to uh, another firm, you're talking about areas of interest. We talked to another another firm recently. And, you know, of course, everybody wants the big, big advisors. And, you know, we say to somebody, well, what's your ideal, you know, I, your ideal recruit, right? Everyone says, oh, a million bucks, whatever. You know, but the fact of the matter is, there's a lot of advisors that do 250, 300, that are good producers. They don't require a lot of time. You know, they're they're got clean CRDs. They're just not maybe just lighting the world on fire in terms of in terms of that business. Um, if it was if I'm starting an, a, a broker dealer today and an RA, that's that's one area that I would I would consider going after because you can scale that. Um, you don't have to give them the same economics. As, as if they were doing 1.5 million versus five, right? Um, and that's a niche market. And you can really provide them a story and a service that, that you know, a million and a half dollar, or two million or three million or four million dollar producer doesn't necessarily need. Because actually that guy or that, that gal, that, that producer actually can be more of a headache and can require more service from you because they're more, they, they can be more demanding, right? They have bigger clients. Well, sometimes those and they have bigger trades and those trades can be can have bigger errors. Right. So there is something to be said for that downline space. Uh, I'll call it the mass affluent within the within the advisor world, because when we look at the industry, I think people are trying to move away. F I say people again, firms are trying to move away from those smaller producers. But there are some firms out there that are willing to take them and they're doing really well. And they're picking up some really good, they're really good advisors. Um, but they have the right, they have the right business plan in place, right? Right. So, like, you know, do you have an automated system that's that's engaging with the client? If, if you do, then you're going to, you're going to win that business over, right? I mean, right. you're going to spend some time as an advisor with these folks, but the point is, they're winning that business because they've focused on it. So if you're, you know, if you if you just started an RA or you've had one for a while and now you're you're looking to grow it and bring advisors on, you, you got to consider starting in one area first before you start checking every single box to say yes. Right. Right. Exactly. We I was talking to a firm and you know their model. I I just it was kind of one of these like well why well why well we. Well, we do this, you know, this is this is what we want to do. Well, why? I just kept asking these questions and I got to the sort of the core of where they're going with this. And I said, well, if that's your reasoning in terms of high, high touch, high service, um, then and, and you're not necessarily willing to spend on staff, more staff or you or you recognize. Stuff. <laughs> right. Or you recognize in their mind it was spend. Sure. Right. Or you or you recognize that at certain levels you have to keep adding more staff and you're sure you want to do that, then you can't be out there looking to hire five or six or seven recruits a year. Right. Right. Because that's contradictory to what your philosophy and I'll, and I'll say your vision and mission statement is all about. And that is to provide the highest level of service for every single advisor that joins their team. Well, if that's what you really believe, then maybe you, you, you can only really hire 
two, uh, uh, two a year, every once every six months, because you need to get that person onboarded and you need to have the right staff and you don't want to overwhelm your current staff because if you overwhelm your current staff with a new person coming on board, it has negative effects to your existing producers, right? So then you run into the situation where a lot of broker dealers do is they're bringing on people, which is great, but then they're losing them out the back door because yeah. they're not, to your point, you're not delivering, continuing to deliver the service to everybody that you have. We're seeing this with with larger institutions that are mature these days, right? This is just, by the way, folks, they're going through the same things yeah. as, you, as the newer firms are. And it's because they're not looking at what the state of the business is today and adapting to it. The, the wealth management business changed a lot in the last 10 years. If, you, if you've been around for 50 years, it's, it's, you've had to change a few times. Yeah. And, and we're seeing it happen. Well, one area that um, just sort of at the tail end of this thing, because I think it's important, um, we're sort of looking at Dale's notes and, uh, and it's a great point and we can go down a whole rabbit hole with this topic and we're not going to. So I just want to talk about it briefly. And that is, um, you know, some people feel like, well, we're, we're at a point now we want to rec- we want to recruit more people. So we need to go and we need to go get a, a financial partner. You know, I need money. Money is what we need to go bring attract more people. And that's not I'm here to say that that's not necessarily your answer. What Dale said was about processes. Sometimes you you can get more efficiencies and deliver a higher level service if you implement better processes within your system, having the right team, but also having the right team doing the right things and just looking at what you're doing well and what you're not doing well. Before you go out and sell part of your company to a PE firm or something, which is basically all that means is you're just getting, you're paying, they're giving you your money back. Like, you're giving you future, future dollars, which is a whole a whole area that I don't want to get into today because I have a very strong opinion about this. Um, let's just say I don't but, think it's but, a good idea. But you're selling part of your business. You're selling your future revenue, right? And the growth. But having more money doesn't doesn't necessarily equate to better recruiting success. And actually, what happens is, and if you're a business owner, you know this when you when you're starting a business and you don't have a lot of money. You're very careful with what you spend it on, right? Which is actually a good thing. And then all of a sudden you get an influx of cash and you start spending like a drunken sailor. And that's not that's not really good. And the same thing happens, and I've seen this with firms out there, that all of a sudden they get this influx of PE money, right? And they just start paying deals to advisors that don't make sense. Right? Or, they, or they spend money in areas that, that don't bring revenue in. Right, because it's an ego-driven thing or whatever it is, right? Um, and so what I'm trying to say to you, as you're listening and you're trying to grow and you're trying to recruit specifically, you don't necessarily need more money, okay? You need a better vision, a stronger purpose, right? Better processes and a team around you, Um And if that team means that you as the business owner make a little bit less, then that's what you should be doing. You should be making, taking, taking a little bit less from your organization and then reinvesting it back into the business. And then you and your team get the benefit of that growth. Why give that growth up to a PE firm, right? That didn't put the hard work in, right? Because you're a PE firm's coming in and maybe you've been in the business for 20 years. So now there and and all of that 20 years of knowledge and experience and going through bear markets and all that crap, right, led to where you are today and the knowledge that you have today. So now all of a sudden you're gonna put that knowledge to work in a different way and you're gonna let some other person that just came in, i.e. a PE firm, get the benefit. I just totally think it's wrong. I think you have to look at your team and look at your company. People buy vision, okay? So many times, and I'll and I'll go back, and I don't, I don't mean to be redundant about this, but it's really a it's really a, um, a great point. So when I was a manager in Red Bank, New Jersey, um, Smith Barney, okay, right down the street, we had Merrill Lynch office, we had a Morgan Stanley office, um, and it was at the time so this was like two thousand ish, right around that time, right. Morgan Stanley was um, had an open checkbook for recruits. 
Smith Barney, on the other hand, we as managers, we got paid on the P&L of our branch, right? So we we're very conscious and aware of what we we're going to spend money on. And we had the lowest deal on the street. And we out recruited both Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley every single time with a lower, like a substantially lower deal. Because you're selling on the vision of the firm. Because we sold the vision of the firm, but we sold the vision of our office and what it meant to be in our office. So my, my time was, I, I worked for Bill Leahy, uh, great guy. Um, and we we just sold this cultural feel. Um, I don't want to say it wasn't really elitist feel, but it was a high, high end boutique shop, well-respected professional environment. Um, and that's what these advisors bought into. Yeah, they wanted to be a part of it. Part of something special. Right. Right. And so that's the moral of this whole story is if you're building an RIA or a broker dealer, even if you're not building a broker dealer, you're just building, you have your own practice and you're just trying to recruit one or two guys to your firm, right? Um, it's really about building something special. People want to be, uh, people are attracted to and want to join something special. Okay. They want to be part of something special. They want to be with people that are special. You look at what Tom Brady did with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, right? Some people joined that team because they knew they want to be part of that. Like, I want to be part of that, what he's doing, right? Some of those people that came on board, they didn't get paid a ton of money, right? But they want to be part of that, what it, what it could be, the excitement of what it could be. And as, a, as an owner of a practice, that you're trying to attract talent, right? Whether it's an RIA, BD, what it doesn't matter. You have to learn how to sell, how to sell what's special about your business and why it's going to be special to the next person coming on board. And what is your vision and what are your core values? And what's your per what's the purpose of the organization? Right? If it's if it's to deliver the highest quality investment advice to the wealthy, to the high net worth individual whatever right where does where, where do you have that in writing where does it say that do you talk about it all the time it should be in everything that you talk about right my friend uh guy ed my maybe you don't know him but he's um just look him up ed my um he talks about saying old things to new people right saying old things meaning say the same story about your vision your values your purpose why they should join you, why they should join you, all of that over and over and over again, just keep saying that to people. That's what they buy into. The economics, if you find the right firm, don't really matter because if you find the wrong firm and you got bad economics, that's a bigger problem, right? You're better off being at the right firm with maybe a little bit lower economics because you'll be happier, you'll be more energized, more excited, you'll be telling the same story and you'll grow faster than going to the wrong firm just because they paid you one or two points more. It's you'll regret every single month that you're there, right? And the money won't matter. Um, and I think so. Listen, Dale, that's what we, uh, we 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 wanted to talk about this because we had gotten like in one in in one week last week we got two different phone calls. One was from a broker dealer, and well, actually, yeah, one was from a broker dealer, and one was from an RIA, and it was like the same. It was like we could have just had them on one call and had the same conversation um, because they both thought they were the best things since sliced bread and they and they really weren't. Not that they weren't good people, but there was nothing special about them. And then they're coming to us and like, how can you help us recruit people to your firm? And and they're shocked when we go back to like the basics of, well, tell us like, what's your vision? And they're like, well... Well, we're really good asset managers. No, 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 no. That's not a vision. <laughs> so, anyway, um, last last comments. Yeah, look, if you're if you're interested in going down that road, you've already done it. Reach out to us. Give Frank a call 856-316-4651 or email him at frank. Well, it's frank at eliteconsultingpartners.com. Right. Yep. And don't forget to go to YouTube and subscribe on YouTube. Listen, go to Apple, you know, Apple, iTunes, wherever it is you're listening to your podcast. Like and subscribe. Leave comments. Leave questions. Um, we love having you here. Hope you enjoyed the show. And we look forward to the next one. Great talk. Thanks for listening to Advisor Talk with Frank LaRosa. If you're looking for more advice or solutions on any topics in the financial services industry, or you just want to subscribe to our podcast, 
head on over to EliteConsultingPartners.com slash podcasts.